Welcome to Charter California Edition. I am Brad Pomerantz. I have been looking forward to this interview for months. My daughter is currently studying the California missions, and little did I know that when I interviewed David Gutierrez, who's a member of the San Gabriel City Council, that he would be able to bring with him today an archaeologist, an anthropologist, that had the pleasure of excavating the San Gabriel mission because of work through the Alameda Quarter East Construction Authority. It's a tangled web, but you will really learn a lot about the mission movement in California through our discussion today. And you will also learn how the Alameda Quarter East Construction Authority is working to make 21st century lives a bit easier while still maintaining the beauty of 19th century California. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. I'm thank very you. excited Thanks. to meet with you. I wanna start our conversation today by speaking with Mr. Gutierrez. As I said, he's the chairman of the Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority, member of the San Gabriel City Council. And why don't you tell us what the authority is and what its purpose is, and then we can explain how John got involved in excavating the San Gabriel mission. Absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity Please. of being here. Uh, the uh, Alameda Corridor East, and better known today as ACE, ACE. Um, was established in 1998, the bra brainchild of the uh, Sangamo Valley Council of Governments. And we identified at that time 22 grade separations that we felt uh, would, uh, as freight uh, transit, uh, increased going east from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach that uh, we absolutely absolutely needed to do be proactive in doing things to uh, provide an easier um, goods movement as well as less than the amount of uh, vehicular traffic and congestion that would be occurring over the next de several decades. Well what's exciting about what you're describing is that the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles are so pivotal to the welfare of this region. I recently learned, gentlemen, that got close to a qu uh, three quarters of a million jobs are reliant upon the ports. Mm -hmm. The challenge though is like you said, through many communities in the Inland Empire and the San Gabriel Valley, these trains will be coming through the communities. They could have a huge number of freight cars attached. You could be stuck for 15 minutes behind a railroad. And so that's what the Alameda Corridor East Project is doing is trying to create What's a great separation, for example? A great separation can mean a number of things. It could be, it basically is uh, at grade crossings what we currently... And grade uh, is ground. Grade is ground. Uh, what we currently see in, in many cities where um, roadways cross train tracks uh, that, that we now will separate them. And there's uh, there's several ways we can do that. We can either um, go on and do an underpass below right. uh, the, the railroad tracks. We can go over the railroad tracks or in, in the case of the San Gabriel project, we will lower the railroad tracks. So let's talk about the San Gabriel project. What is that project? And then I wanna hear how he got involved. Uh, it, the San Gabriel project, no, better known as the trench, um, will separate four grade crossings in the city of San Gabriel. And this again, as I had just mentioned, will um, be done by lowering the railroad tracks, uh, creating a, a trench. What's a trench? Um, basically, you're gonna see uh, excavation of dirt uh, that is going to take the tracks as we currently know them today and lower them uh, well below grade level, ground mm -hmm. level, uh, so that again, uh, we could accomplish these four so grade crossings. the train will go below ground level. Correct. And the cars will go above. And the cars will remain at the same level Level that they currently um, uh, cross the tracks. So let's talk to John Dietler. Serge, I want to hear about your background. I can't imagine you ever thought you'd get involved in great separation, but somehow you did. Give us your background and then we'll get a sense of what's going on. Sure, sure. I've been an archaeologist for my whole career. So I've uh, gotten my PhD from UCLA uh, in 2008 and uh, rather than going in the traditional academic route, uh, getting a job as a professor, say, at a university, I chose to go into the environmental industry where mm. professional archaeologists such as myself work in advance of construction projects such as the San Gabriel Trench and ensure that those projects don't impact archaeology. Archaeology is considered an important part of the environment and it's protected by both state and federal law. But one would think that if you're dealing with archaeology, you'd be in Africa. I mean, who would have thunk that you'd be literally right down the road in San Gabriel. Let's talk about San Gabriel specifically. I learned recently that San Gabriel and the San Gabriel mission plays a pivotal role in the history of the city of Los Angeles and therefore the entire region. Either of you, 
talk to us about the San Gabriel mission and what the missionaries did on that fateful day. What year was it? 1781. 1781. There it was, September 4th, 1781. What happened on that day? Absolutely. The um, San Gabriel Mission was the fourth of 21 missions in California, but by, in, in many regards it was the most important. Uh, and perhaps the best measure of that is it's the springboard to the most important city on the West Coast in terms of numbers of people, and that's Los Angeles. Uh, the founding of Los Angeles happened through San Gabriel. They literally walked from the San Gabriel Mission to uh, Los Angeles and founded what was to become this great city. It was called the Pueblo de Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and the people who walked, the 44 of them, were the Los Pobladores. Mm -hmm. And didn't they essentially meet around Alvaro Street in they, downtown? Isn't that they, the, the location where they landed? That is correct. And, exactly. And we've been um, re uh, walking right. the, those oh, steps every year. Every I know, year. Every year, yes, I know that. Following the steps right. of our ancestors from the city of San Gabriel to um, the Pueblo there in, in Los Angeles. It? It's about nine miles. Okay, so it seems farther, but not so much. Tell us about, sir, the, uh, the life of a missionary in the San Gabriel Mission. Well, when did that mission operate? Let's start from there. Sure. The mission was initially founded in 1771 at a different location than it is currently. Mm -hmm. We moved to its current location in 1775 and then operated officially through 1834. So it's a fairly narrow window, actually. And, and while on the East Coast, America was being founded, on the West Coast, it was still under... Was it Spanish Dominion, Mexican Dominion? What was it back then? It was initially Spanish Dominion. This was the edge of the Spanish Empire, literally the very edge. This Cal Alta California was colonized by the Spanish mostly as a bulwark, as a stop of mm -hmm. uh, Russian, um, uh, Russian colonial gains. In Alaska, Russians were coming down the coast. The Spanish wanted to stop that, so they put the, the California missionaries here on the edge of the world uh, to prevent that. So tell us about the missionaries, the people who were living at the San Gabriel Mission during this 60-year period. Sure. Well, the the, the missionaries were uh, were Spaniards and Mexicans, uh, and they were. It's important to remember that they were really a minority in these communities. These were Native American towns that were founded and run by a handful of Spanish priests and soldiers. I want to hear about one Native American. I believe. Uh, it was of the Tongva people, is that right? Mm -hmm. And there was, was it a woman who mm -hmm. was in, what was, was it a toy Purina? That's right. Tell us about her. Sure. So uh, the, the Spanish came in and they had a very noble goal. The goal was to turn Native Americans into Christians and turn them into farmers, turn them into Spanish uh, country people. Well, noble to them. Noble to them, and exactly. I don't know it's if it's very, noble to the Native Americans. It's a very one-sided goal, right? right? And that's that's part of the hardship. Mm -hmm. uh, th the soldiers that were here um, were sort of out of the control of the missionaries, and they uh, were they could be abusive at times. And then that goal itself was uh, offensive to people, particularly people who were essentially the native priests. They right. had their own religion to protect and to spread, and, and to have the Christian religion forced upon them was, was an awful burden to bear. And so at many missions, including San Gabriel, there were efforts at rebellion, at, at trying to throw off the Spanish um, uh, captors. Mm -hmm. And uh, Toy Perina was a central figure in San Gabriel's attempt at uh, revolt. Okay, when we come back, I want to speak about how it came to be that you, John Dietler, were brought in to excavate the San Gabriel mission because in the end, it has to do with the Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority at the great separations we mentioned. And we will be talking about this miraculous photo, which you can see right here, as well as some of the artifacts that you found in California history like I am. You will want to stick around for this very interesting discussion and, and we'll talk about and continue our discussion about how the 21st century met the 19th century. Uh, we're speaking with John Dietler. He is a project archeologist with the San Gabriel Mission, as well as David Gutierrez, who is chair of the Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority and a member of the San Gabriel City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're still with us. We are speaking with John Dietler and David Gutierrez. They are working together. I bet they never thought they would because he is an elected official. He is the chair of the Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority. John is an archaeologist. And explain to us why the authority had to retain the, the fine services of an archaeologist. Well, as John mentioned earlier, um, it, uh, the uh, law is very specific about the process of what needs to take place any time that there may be um, artifacts, uh, especially with regard to the possibility of uh, recovering human remains. And, and so what happened here is you're creating some great separations mm -hmm. around the San Gabriel Mission. Give us a sense of the map. The um, uh, Railroad track as it currently exists uh, parallels the front part of the mission by literally, a, li literally, right. and uh, separate is separated by the uh, by about 300 feet or so okay. uh, from uh, the closest point of the San Gabriel Mission. So when you decided that you were going to go down mm -hmm. to bring the, the railroad tracks down, that meant you were excavating. That is correct. Okay, so let's talk about what we're seeing here, uh, John Dietler. Absolutely. This is, uh, in my opinion, the most important find of our uh, excavation. We have here the ruins of a, a grist mill, a grain mill, built by Joseph Chapman in uh, the 1820s. Uh, and, and as it turns out, it's attached to a whole series of earlier reservoirs. Did you have any idea you would find something as magnificent as this? No. We had an idea that, that some part of that was there, but we had no idea that it was attached to all these earlier things. Basically, the entire story of the distribution of water at uh, the San Gabriel Mission is told in this one location. And, and as you can imagine, with an early agricultural community in a dry place like California, water is enormously important to the success of the mission. And speaking of water, and I'm wearing gloves. John has allowed me to touch these artifacts as long as I wear gloves. What is this piece? This is, uh, the Spanish term for it is caño, but it is a clay pipe. So it's much like a modern sewer pipe made out of clay or, or a modern water pipe made out of metal that carried water from its source uh, in springs at the edge of the foothills down to the San Gabriel Mission. And did you find this near this or inside of this? Is that how it worked? Is that how it happened? Uh, directly next to it. I can actually indicate on the photo Please. if you'd like. The, um, these two lines right here are pipelines. Uh, they're encased in brickwork, so it's a little bit difficult to tell, but those are pipelines that were draining into a uh -huh. reservoir. Okay, so in addition to some of these larger items, I wanna go through some of the smaller items that you found, Great. and they are truly miraculous. Mm -hmm. This is a coin that I'm gonna pull out. I am wearing gloves, so I feel safe and hopefully John will be able to zoom in on this coin. Why don't you tell us what this coin is? Sure, this would have been uh, one of the, the coins of the realm at the time. It's a Spanish coin, uh, actually not made in Spain, made in uh, Peru, as much of their silver coinage was, since ultimately that's where the silver was coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, minted in 1816 and, and used uh, just like we use coinage today. Did you have any idea you would actually find I mean, monetary items? No. The, um, you typically find money in, uh, people don't lose money very often, so right. you typically find it uh, maybe intentionally buried if, uh, in, in a pot if somebody was trying to hide their money or something mm -hmm. like that, or maybe buried with people. But uh, finding a coin in, in what's ultimately a garden, that's where we're excavating, the garden part of the mission, is uh, it's random. It's just somebody accidentally lost it. Speaking of people, mm -hmm. did you find human moraine, remains? Because I know that was the number one concern. Mm -hmm. There was a cemetery off-site. You were not involved in excavating that area was not going to be implicated. Exactly. We were reasonably confident that we would not find any intact human remains, any, any burials, because anyone who died during the mission period should have been buried in the mission cemetery, which is more than 300 feet away across the street, right. well outside of the project. Uh, but like accidentally losing coins, body parts can get accidentally sure. disassociated from their original burial. We found two small body parts, one being a tooth, which a, a living person might lose right. a tooth, and the other being a small foot bone. Now, you did find something I thought that was very interesting. This I'm going to pull out. It is actually a beautiful piece of tile. Mm -hmm. Explain to me what this is, and then I'll show you uh, kind of the, the punchline in terms of the tile. Absolutely. So the building materials that were commonly used in the San Gabriel Mission were uh, uh, baked clay items, things mm -hmm. like bricks, like we use today, were some of the common things. They used um, these tiles as both floor tiles and as uh, brick-like materials. They made thousands of these at the mission. Okay, but on the flip side of this tile, 
This is very unusual. This is Tell got, us about this. Those are dog footprints. Uh, we knew they had dogs there from historical records, but it's really great to see direct evidence of it. And they tell a fun story at the San Gabriel Mission that uh, when you would make these out of wet clay, you'd, you'd dry them in the sun, and you'd put children in charge of protecting them from Oops. passing animals. Somebody fell asleep on the job in this Clearly, case. Clearly, but I kind of like it. I mean, it actually oh, says a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, you would expect to find some uh, animal remains, I presume. Absolutely. And you did find some ani animal remains. And what am I going to be holding here, if I may, sir? So the wealth of the San Gabriel Mission was measured not in coinage, but in cattle. The um, San Gabriel Mission was an agricultural community that mm. grew plants uh, for, to feed themselves, but mm -hmm. their major product was cow hides. So uh, f finding cow bones, not at all a surprise. We found uh, tens of thousands of these. This is the end of a cow arm bone or a leg, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the front legs. And uh, it's it's a very massive bone. One of the fun things about it is the end that's on the palm of your hand mm -hmm. has got chop marks on it. So you can see that mm. someone took a cleaver, which is very different than how we butcher bones today. Now we use saws. Uh, the, traditionally, the Spanish would use cleavers to separate the bones into different cuts of meat. Speaking of animals, you also found a piece that I would say is in outstanding condition considering what happened to it. Uh, let's talk about this piece right here. I want to be very delicate with it because it is delicate and it also focuses upon um, the interaction between humans and animals at the San Gabriel Mission. What is this? Right, one of the great changes of the Europeans in general and the Spanish in particular coming to the Americas is that they brought all their European animals with them, including cattle as we mentioned and sheep. These are sheep shears. They would have functioned like a large pair of scissors and they were used seasonally to remove the sheep's wool to use in clothing. Would you have expected to find something like this intact? No, you would expect most of the artifacts we found are quite small, they're fragmentary, right. and, and this is in remarkable condition considering its age. Okay, so I want to continue on our show and tell exhibition because I'm enjoying it very much. I hope you are as <laughs> well. Another really beautiful piece. Um, the detail, I hope you'll be able to see the detail here. John, I don't know if you can zoom in on this. What am I holding right now? So that is a religious medallion. Much as uh, modern Catholics wear crucifixes and other saints medallions, they did uh, historically as well. This is a medallion that has on one side, the side you're showing, an image of Mary and Jesus. It's got Queen Mary on a throne with baby Jesus in her lap. Mm -hmm. And the other side has got a picture of a male saint. He's, he's got a beard. It's, uh, it's fairly corroded, so it's difficult to tell which saint it is. But it would have been a... Um, a probably a very valuable uh, piece at its time, and again, it was accidentally lost in the garden. Apparently, now, speaking of corrosion, I asked you before. I would have expected that these items would have been cleaned, mm -hmm. polished, mm -hmm. but that's not the strategy today. Explain. That's right. Um, historically, archaeologists and, and historians and museum professionals uh, were very aggressive about cleaning artifacts. We could have applied uh, acidic solutions to remove some of the corrosion and really bring out some of that detail. The trouble is those processes are harmful. And now the preference uh, with conservators is to, to lightly clean, to dry brush, and then to stabilize. So we've got these in, in stable packaging. They've got uh, relative humidity sensors uh, with them. And the idea is to preserve them for future study without causing harm. Uh, David, I presume that you went to some of the excavations, and I want to hear what it was like for you. Uh, it must have been stunning on so many levels. You know, it's like a big a kid in a candy store. I have to think that if you and I were there together, we would have just been mesmerized. Oh, absolutely, and I, and I can't um, overstate the amount of pride that I have uh, as a lifelong resident uh, of the city uh, to have Do this you know project. Do if you descend from San Gabriel missionaries? I actually, on my grandmother, on my father's mother's side, her grandfather was a Gabrielino Indian. I mean, um, good grief. So they could have held this. It, they they, they could have well held could have, these yes, items. Yes. I mean, they could have held these shears. This could have been their coins. I mean, that's got to be particularly poignant for you. It, it is. And again, um, having uh, the opportunity to serve on the San Gabriel City Council, chair of the Alameda Corridor East, uh, just adds to the pride this that, is that, uh, that I We're not done. We'll be right back. When we come back, we'll go through more items, belt buckles, pottery. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. If you're just joining us, we are speaking with David Gutierrez. He's a member of the San Gabriel City Council, also the chair of the Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority. He has brought with him the project archaeologist on the excavation of the San Gabriel Mission. His name is John Dietler. And as we mentioned, ACE is going through a great separation and it's right next to the San Gabriel Mission and as a result you and your team were brought in to make sure that any artifacts human remains were um, recovered and respected and I am glad you're here because you have brought with you some really beautiful artifacts from that very important period during the 19th century. I must hold up this belt buckle which is really Special. Why don't you talk to us about this, John Dietler? Sure. So that is uh, a later item. That is a U.S. military belt buckle. It is, uh, by its style, judging by its style, it's immediately pre-Civil War, so uh, 1850s perhaps, um, which is when the Americans first started to enter into California. Uh, soldiers were never stationed at Mission San Gabriel, but they likely visited from nearby Los Angeles yes. as, a, as a historical attraction. Right. So how do you think that this got here? Again, what a lot of the things happened? that we have are, are just accidental losses, but it could be that this was actually traded, perhaps. A soldier traded a, a, a local um, San Gabriel person for something, and then they used it for a while. And lost it. But given its condition, it's something that somebody would have missed. And speaking of, I'll call them foreign items, you'd mm -hmm. expect to see items from Peru, from Mexico, from Spain. Sure. You would not expect to see a piece of pottery like this, and tell me why. Well, sure. So that is that is um, a British ceramic. So British. Uh, that's right, British. The British were not in California. No. But, well, they were. They were trading. So they would. Well, come, that's where that's where you've it was. heard of San Francis, uh, Sir Francis Drake, and uh, folks would come around the Horn and uh, trade things like pottery to the Californians. Trade for uh, California exports like uh, hide and tallow from the cattle. So we have the British piece of pottery. We also have some traditional. Is it Mexican pottery? Mm -hmm. Is that what we call it? Yeah, and uh, Mexican and uh, and Spanish, they use the same mm -hmm. style of pottery. This is uh, Mahalika, it's called. So it would have been their kind of fancy dishware at the mission. Mm -hmm. The color is still pretty brilliant. It's beautiful, Very nice. yeah. Your father's mother's grandfather could have held this. Very could have made well this. Could have, yes. What about this? I'm not even sure what it is. Why don't you tell us what this is well, right Well, speaking here. of odd uh, yes. discoveries in terms of where they came from, this is ultimately made in Britain as well, but it was made for a Haitian army. Uh, the, Haitian, um, as in Haiti. As in Haiti. As in the Caribbean. That's right. As in the king of, uh, of Haiti, uh, his name was Christophe, ordered uh, a number of uniform buttons from Britain for his soldiers. He was deposed and, and died prior to ever using these for his military. So they were dispersed as trade items up and down the West Coast. So it was created as a military item, but probably ultimately used by a Native American as, as an ornament, as a brooch or something. It's got a beautiful picture of... Christoph's uh, personal family crest, though, which is a mm -hmm. phoenix, uh, mm. uh, text in French, so clearly not a Spanish item, just uh, one of these worldly trade goods that just ends up fantastic. Mm -hmm. We also have, um, I guess this is a Spanish spur, is yes. that right? And that's a fun item because, again, it's unusual. Um, it's not a common find. And that was actually donated by a local uh, neighbor. We had really great relationships with the locals, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that we were creating a little bit of dust with our excavation. So this was found not in your excavation, but in someone's backyard? Exactly. Exactly. Come on. Well, that's one of the, th the points I think that we should make is that uh, the San Gabriel Mission was a town. It wasn't a church. It was The church was the center of the town. Right. So it was an entire town, and a lot of that town is in private hands now. It's underneath people's gardens. And uh, when you're digging through your garden, there's the possibility of finding artifacts. And, and this, this uh, woman did the right thing and donated it to us, and we're going to ultimately put it in a museum. Talk to me about how long this process took, how many people were on your team. Begin. Well, sure. This this ex this research actually began for us back in 2008, 2009, with early uh, stage overview of the project area, deciding where the uh, the important archaeological sites might be, and then focusing in on those. We focused in on this particular area, and we chose well because we found just a real treasure trove, as we've seen. How did you know? Uh, we, it's uh, through careful uh, research. Uh, we initially did historical research, just looking at background documents, historical maps, uh, what other archaeologists had found. We did a surface survey where we walked over the area. We did ground penetrating radar to see whether there were underground structures. And all of those things allowed us to hone in on this area as the most intact and, and richest part of the site. And you have some very large pieces. What am I holding here? So that is a roof tile. It is uh, like you'd see on any kind of modern building with a Spanish style roof. It's the the difference is that this is more than 200 years old. There were an you initially see the beautiful a, color. Still got that great reddish orange mm -hmm. color. There were um, a number of buildings on this site that were demolished, and we find pieces of them, including roof tiles. 
I want to get a sense of what's going to happen with all these items. You have been so kind to bring them to us, but where do they go from here? That is a great part of our story. So we've, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mention previously, but we've found more than 200,000 items so far. Just an enormous and you have, we have 10 here, and you found 200,000. Mm -hmm. That's right. These are you know, some of the most attractive of the lot, but we've got... Um, you know, tens of thousands of cow bones, for example. That was one of the major things they had at the mission. But lots of these tiles and other things, and then a, a number of uh, ceramics, beads. Um, we have more than really need to go into the museum. So we have sort of the best of the items, the things with the greatest research potential, like these items here are going to go right. to UCLA. That's the nice. museum in the region that has meets federal standards, so that's the requirement. <coughs> but uh, the things that we have extras of that, that have lesser research value, we uh, are going to uh, make available to research institute or to I'm sorry to uh, local. Historical um, societies, societies museums. the mm -hmm. Mission Museum, the uh, the railroad will have access to some of these. That they have their own museum to uh, help bring the story out to a broader audience. What has this meant for you as a recent PhD? Sure, yeah, this has been uh, the highlight of my career so far. It's and uh, you're young, so you have so much ahead of you. How great that this already happened. I, that that is wonderful. It's true, mm -hmm. and I hope that to uh, to publish material on this for years to come. So this is something that we're finished with the excavation, but there's there's so much more that we can do to what, tell the story. What's going to happen to this? And, and honestly, I think that's probably the best part yeah. of the story. This is yeah. this is a, a large and valuable item. It's uh, tied up with uh, the very first industrialization of California, the first American to live in the region. Um, it is. It would have been destroyed by this project right. had, had we not done this research and had we not gone about it the right way. We are actually going to pick it up and move it. We're going to preserve. Oh, you it. can. Yes, it's, it's preservable. Yes. Where's going it going to go? Uh, well, we have a number of sites um, selected for possible relocation, but ideally within the city of San Gabriel. Uh, hopefully, as close as possible to where it came from and very accessible to the public. If we can move into the 21st century, David Gutierrez, why don't you tell us why? It was worth it to uncover all of this. Um, yes, there's the historical element of it, but for 21st century Californians, this project is going to make us safer. It is going to make us safer. And, and if I might just also add that uh, there was a, an ex a very big uh, opportunity here uh, to take advantage of this archaeological dig. And we shared that educational opportunity with local school children. Nice. Nice. Um, and uh, to date, we've had over 3,000 visitors come uh, and watch the process as it's been unfolding over the last several months. But talk to us about the safety elements. The safety elements, uh, you know, the uh, emergency department for our local hospital lies on the north side of these railroad tracks. Mm. Um, from an emergency services standpoint, the transportation of me uh, people needing medical care uh, many times was hindered because of uh, trains crossing Literally. and and blocking the passage of emergency vehicles, uh, rescue ambulances, and so on. So as we move forward, uh, that, that problem is going to be eliminated. Construction begins when? We're looking that it uh, will probably start the fall this this fall. Okay, mm -hmm. in the fall of. Okay, and how long will the process take? About 44 months. So, uh, for for mathematicians, what is that? 12, 24, 36, almost four years. Yes. And the cost of the project? We're currently thinking that it's going to be right around $460 million. But that money is already set aside, Yes, correct? it is. It is fully funded at this time. From where? It's from a, a number of sources, state and federal funds that uh, we've been able to uh, receive. Uh, we've, we've worked hard at trying to uh, secure those funds over the last 10 years, and uh, we've been very successful at doing so. Do you expect to have other areas that you will need to excavate within the uh, corridor's authority? Uh, other than San Gabriel? Yeah. Uh, possibly, but most of the other grade separations are um, going to be do done underneath the railroad tracks. Uh, excavation is a process of, of going underneath the tracks, but probably not having the significance that we have here in the city of San Gabriel. All I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank this you. has been thank my you. treat. I Our hope pleasure. it's been your treat as well. What a great way to bring 19th century life back to the 21st century. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching Charter, California Edition.